Uh, good morning. My name is Constant Dullard. Uh, Constant Dullard. Everybody that speaks English might think that my name is a pseudonym, like meaning all the time boring art. Nobody understands the joke. It's it's my real name. It's my real name. Anyway, I'll start like that. But um, I'll start with like my struggle as an artist to deal with contemporary materialities and how to commodify them. Um, let me see, because this is playing now. So this is an early work in around 2008, where I made the YouTube button move. See, it drops. And um, the weird thing was that um, I recorded it just to be able to talk at lectures like this, so I could just have it automated. But then a few years later, like a couple of people made responses, and the YouTube player, actually the interface, of course, changed. And the nice thing was that I had a recording of the YouTube player. So I could actually still show the original manifestation of the work. Which is, it seems really insignificant, but in this art historical context, and especially if you're like an artist that wants to historicize themselves to make them feel better in the morning, um, then this kind of recording is really nice. So in the end, even uh, I recorded other people's work, and I started to record other people's work that were responding to me, and I was making these screen captures, and they turned out to be pretty valuable. Or valuable as in like, you know, as reference material. So I kind of m set up an infrastructure together with a friend of mine, Sarkovsky in Berlin, an art historian, and we set up this method in which you would record an artwork, so you would record using it on the right side, but on the left side you see the screen grab. And they would play simultaneously, and we aggressively wanted to add that to be hosted by Google, so on YouTube. So they would own some of the responsibility for keeping these kind of archives. But the thing is, with a lot of these uh, internet artworks, it's not necessarily uh, the internet that uh, artwork that you're saving, you're actually... Um, documenting it because there's a difficulty reenacting the work later when there's a technical failure. And this is inherently what I set up that you would emphasize the documentation. You would see these works as a kind of performative work. So they become more performative, the server is performing for you, than that it as actually is a consolidated single commodity. So then, okay, so commodity requires multiple agreed upon values to be complete ready for exchange. If you want to sell an artwork, right? Like, or if you want to donate an artwork to a museum or if somebody wants to take care of it. So anyway, so I know there's a few things, single controlled yet shared access, necessary files for it to work, documentation. And this is the documentation like how it's shown or how it's preferably exhibited, a contract for the exchange for the person who starts to take care of it. A receipt that it's actually real, so it's a, the proof of authenticity, and an end of work protocol. So what happens if the work doesn't become technically feasible anymore? So what happens, I made works with Google, for example, what happens to the work if Google doesn't offer this kind of technical support anymore? Is my work still relevant? Is there only a documentation of it available? as a museum or privately, for fun or professionally. It might just be that you would like to collect art with very contemporary material. Why build a collection like all the others, right? Art made by the generation that made the transition to life with the internet, and even early art dealing with the internet has quite a limited production and a high artistic relevance. And the early web isn't coming back, nor will Impressionism, or the Renaissance for that matter. Not only oil paintings or videotapes, but a digital image, a database, an app, or websites are artworks now. If you are interested in art that might be considered avant-garde today, and is being written about in art history books in the last decades, you will be interested in artists that use contemporary materials, right? Like, what are you watching this on? Probably on a network screen of sorts, like a phone. Not in a newspaper or on TV, let alone on a painting. Anyway, so imagine you have a small yet intense collection of works which are already in the newest art history books, and you are lucky enough to have started collecting a while ago. And you or your institution is just really happy to have gotten the chance to own some parts of actual art history in the making. Maybe you know how to take care of the artworks yourself, but you just want to be sure everything is taken care of without any worries. Here is where we say every valuable collection should be taken care of in the right way cared for by people who know what they're doing. 
people using state-of-the-art methods to store your precious collection, making sure it is safe for prosperity and your own enjoyment, of course. With these new materials, it can sometimes be complicated. Online storage, websites have to be accessible, works stop working and need to be emulated. What did the artist want? Did my credit card expire? Did I just lose the domain name? Did I just get hacked? This is where Art Host steps in. The professional, museum-grade art storage designed for a new generation of media and online art. Uh, I'll let the uh, commercial continue, but I made the simplified commercial for this initiative that we set up, like uh, as art hosts, that uh, there could be uh, private collectors. So not only the institutional collectors that have time to go to wonderful conferences like this, but uh, also the, actually the private collectors that want to own an artwork that they don't necessarily immediately know how to take care of themselves. So they would, for example, there would be art collectors that would have a painting and they would go and store the painting in a dedicated storage where humidity is taken care of and all these things. But what happens with these digital files and do these uh, private collectors have access to that? And how do you make that accessible? Anyway, that's what this initiative is about. So we set up Art House and it's just launched uh, this month. So it's a service where if people buy an online artwork, it's hosted and they take care of it. And um, I was happy to be involved and initiate that. But of course, for me, there's still this struggle as an artist to kind of break my own boundaries, to kind of figure out like how this whole stuff works and see if I can find other materials within my artistic um, practice. So for example, with machine learning, we found out what the most boring color in the world is. And I called it dull brown. As in, my name is Dull Art. Dull Art. I make Dull Art. I started the brand called Dull Tech, and now I got Dull Brown. Um, so Dull Brown is the most boring color in the world, but this is a super easy work. Basically, this is just an an RGB code, right? Like really, really specific RGB code. But then still, uh, it's a website, and it's a static website. There's not so much dependencies there. And uh, this is a map that we when we were setting up art hosts that we were talking about and how I needed to use to explain how the commodity would travel between the collector and the institution and what role I would play as an artist. So this becomes inherently really, really complicated, right? But I'll explain a few things quickly. Like, for example, the escrow service. So the escrow service would be that even if the private collector defaults and doesn't take care of, doesn't pay for it, there's still an institution that takes care of it. So that becomes the escrow service. So there's an in-between kind of function. So there's still a caretakership that the person pays for, but it doesn't mean that the, if you would use a commercial uh, web host, for example, the work would just get destroyed. After a while, it would just get deleted. Right? So this becomes problematic. So we try to use and implement this escrow service. They need to control the domain names or a point of access you know, for like a run your own DNS system or being able to copy these kind of systems. And of course, like actually, uh, there's wonderful systems in place to do these things and wonderful people that have been thinking about this. But then still, it's like, how do you treat this if it's a private commodity of a collector? Um, so then there's, for example, another example where I tried to, where I tried to break my own rules. So this is a domain name I claimed, the .xxx, xxxxx domain name. And it reloads, and it reloads the same image all the time. And I made this work because I thought to celebrate the death of the URL, that the beauty of the URL is not re relevant anymore because everybody Googles everything, right? So you don't actually type in a URL anymore. And anyway, the time of the .com, .org, .net is over because you can buy .funny or .irrelevant or .anything domain name. Anyway. Um, but this work, for example, then becomes really difficult because then you have to control all these different domain names. Then, like, how's that infrastructure? How do you control that DNS? Anyway, so it's interesting that I try to set up the protocol that I break then myself again. Anyway, so you need to archive files and you can use potentially the interplanetary file system, right? So, this is just the technical, like, where are the actual files hosted, right? So, Internet, in, interplanetary file system is interesting, but you also need to uh, archive the documentation. So what kind of documentation of an online work and like how do you, how do you actually engage with this? Do you scrape kind of usage? Do you make bots interact with the work if it's an interactive work? Do you then record these sessions? 
And Web Recorder by Rhizome is a beautiful initiative where you can actually record your browsing session of a specific work and then you can reenact that session. But it's basically like a video recording. It doesn't record the entire work, it records your session with the work. Um, but for example, scraping the responses, so I made a website called The Revolving Internet in 2010, which was a significant, had a significant social impact at that time. So I did re record all the tweets that were made about that work before it was actually sold. So then I included all the actual references that were made on Twitter about this work into the sale, so into the packaging, to actually make that part of the commodity. So the, the social reference to that work is part of this commodity now. Anyway, the revolving internet.com is still funny work, it's still active, and Google recently unblocked me again, so that's nice. Um, but for example, I'm also making uh, poems. So for example, I'm making poems that I post to Instagram pictures, like to no one's way around, protecting highways between safe and sound, so within the expanding fences you can stay, ascending on diversity's decay, extrapolating the farce coordinate, confining the stagnant within the conservative state. So I have hundreds of bot armies quote my poems to other people's Instagram pictures. So how do you archive that? You know, so that's, for example, where Rip Recorder comes in. So then I record the sessions, I record the bots, I record their pictures, and then I can actually scrape everything. But then the relevance of this picture, that this is a picture by the Department of Homeland Security, it's harder to archive. And the bot, all the bot armies I made um, used SIM cards. I also still make artworks with the SIM cards physical works, so the SIM cards for all the art that are needed for all the artificial profiles to get their validation, SMSs. Um, I make these works with the SIM cards and then I still, anyway. And you get, if you post a picture of this work, you get beautiful comments automated. So my army automatically starts to give you tons of compliments <laughs> on like how beautiful the picture is. And especially, wish I had this outfit becomes really relevant or so attractive, or, hmm, I love your shots. Anyway, these beautiful, irrelevant, kind of automated compliments that are given to your picture, just when you photograph my work. Well, not th that particular work. Um, anyway, so there's a protocol, right? Like the protocol, what, what happens when a work start, stops functioning? When, for example, this type of work would stop functioning? What happens? What's the protocol? If somebody buys it, what's the protocol that you give to the collector? <coughs> so there could be an emulation, for example, but like, what is this emulation based on? Is that based on trust? Do I trust the institution to emulate it in a way that I allow? But then could I, for example, allow a certain browser or a certain server or a certain operating system or could I sign off on a certain quality of emulation that would be okay? Could I have another scenario displaying the documentation, so purely the video, could I have that ready? Or could it actually be restored? Could actually the full work be restored? Um, so these are a bunch of the bots I was, I was buying for earlier works, because I decided to buy bots for myself and to make myself look better on Instagram. And this was around 2013. And I started to look at like the materiality of these bots. When, so I, it, this is when I started to archive these bots. So this is, for example, a person that studied at ITM, but I think they meant MIT, because they also say graduated instead of graduated. And this is one of my favorites, John Alain, and I'll read his bio. It says, I'll prove to the world that I would ecom some hin in Porant to they ned someday. And I think this is a beautiful motto to live by. Especially also, I love so much Austin Bieber. I think that might be Justin Bieber. Anyway, but the materialities of bots being made with like inherent mistakes included in them, or how they would crop their pictures. These automated crop pictures. These were beautiful ephemera for me to archive already. Um, and you can marathon on a snowboard, I didn't know that. Is the snowboard slope actually like 42 <laughs> kilometers long? Anyway. Um, 
And then I found all these people that are really in competition for Instagram likes. Like, for example, this is a curator who wants to, you know, it's necessary for a curator to be really relevant. But I found another curator, Hans Ulrich Obrist, who had at that time close to 100,000 followers. So he was more relevant on Instagram than this curator. So I thought, it's kind of sad. So I gave this curator 100,000 followers. Because I thought, yeah, you know, it's so sad. Just want to help these people out. And then I saw this young, aspiring artist, you know, just new on Instagram, trying to figure this thing out. You know, and I thought, I'll give them 100,000 followers because I want them to be the same as the curator. You know, it's unfair, at least, like white males battling with each other. It's so sad, you know, such a waste of energy. They could be more proactive in other fields. You know, or like this guy, an art critic for some kind of magazine, give him 100,000 followers. Or like Ai Weiwei, who was posting all these pictures of dead children, and I thought, like, it's not necessary, man. Just get yourself 100,000 followers. Be equal to the other people. I wanted to spread some socialism, you know? Good old-fashioned socialism, injecting artificial capital into social media. So, yes, I am kind of known as the Lenin of social media, but this Hans Ulrich Obrist, I see he just needed a little bump up to 100,000. He didn't need that much. Or like this guy, Simon de Puri. Anyway, so this becomes, it becomes weird, right? Like, so when I have these, these works, so what, what are the dependencies? Are it linked servers? Is it the Instagram servers? Is it the people, how they commented? Um, are there certain data sets necessary for the work? Um, I'm over time, I'll hurry up. Um, I'll skip this. Well, actually, this is Dull Dream. You can go to dulldream.xyz and try it out yourself. I made a, a, a neural network filter that actually, if you upload the picture, it will make it more boring for you. Because <laughs> um, it's, you know, stuff is just too fucking exciting. Um, but like this is a work, for example, with with Wikipedia, but then this, what happens when Wikipedia is no longer Wikipedia, you know? Or maybe, you know, when, what happens when you don't give these five dollars to Wikipedia and they stop functioning, you know? Then is, does this work stop functioning because it's a live work, it's a live collage where you can interact with this work? Anyway, then there's a question, I'll skip through this a bit quickly, then there's a question of like provenance checking, like who owns the work, how do you deal with the work, and then you have like all this blockchain technology of like tracking who owns what and like how is that registered in the blockchain, a big ledger of blockchain and then you have different companies. I work with a scribe who is now, this icon means they're dead, um, monograph or bitmark. There's like beautiful uh, people running these kind of systems to track these works and artworks and who owns these artworks. And then of course Seth Siegel out made like an artist contract. So a lot of work has been made in this, in this, um, in this field, so legal context to keep work public, framing of caretakership, a resale clause, what happens if the collector resells the work, um, and well, defining this external trust partner who can emulate the work, this trust institution is Rhizome in my case, or can you, whatever, the, the accepted browser, like what browser do I accept for certain artworks to be emulated in, these kind of things. Um, so the story is, bit longer than 15 minutes, I'm already way over time, but I'll end with a fun project where after I equalized all these people to 100,000 uh, followers, I thought I should be way more dramatic, and I actually started a Facebook army of 15,000 soldiers in 2015, and uh, this is one of the, or this is a sequence of some of the, some of the soldiers that I registered, or I had registered, and the process of registering 15,000 accounts on on Facebook is pretty intense. Um, and then I had to think of content, so they started to post these uh, uh, essays on identity in German to their accounts, but they were actually registered in America. So I had Hessian uh, mercenary soldiers fight uh, an online war in the United States, because I thought that's the most relevant battle, battling ground for fake accounts. But the fun thing was that that was in 2015, so it's one year before the election. So I'm really, this was one of my 
um, high points of my career were actually uh, one year before the American election and all the fake news happened, I warned against the problem with fake identities and fake news online. Anyway, whatever. Um, I'll end with this. Every protocol is meant to be made useless. Thank you very much.